Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, about one of the three original killers to be released alongside the game, who has been a darling of the community from day one. Max Thompson Jr., better known as the Hillbilly. It's hard to find, um, anything in DBD, much less a killer of all things, who is liked as much as the Hillbilly. When Double Daylight came out, he was by far the strongest of the original three killers, and for a very long time was considered top tier. But unlike most top tiers, and certainly unlike DBT's current top tier killers, Hillbilly was almost universally considered fair and fun by both sides, largely due to his high skill cap. Pre dropping pallets against a Billy trying to curve you is considered a cardinal sin in many circles. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you just how incredibly unpopular the introduction of the overheat mechanic was. But there is far more to Billy's charm than just his gameplay. The Hillbilly, much like several of the early original killers, was designed first and foremost as a shout out to a particular breed of classic slasher horror. While the Trapper was a reference to the typical marked muscle man slasher like Jason Voorhees, the Hillbilly was a reference to, um, well, rural hillbilly horror, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Hills Have Eyes. The aesthetic similarities are obvious. He's heavily physically deformed, like the hillbillies in The Hills Have Eyes, and he wields a cattle hammer and runs around with a chainsaw screaming incoherently, like everyone's favourite basement dweller. But unlike the Trapper, the hillbilly captured so many people's imaginations because, despite being an obvious reference to those movies and their tropes, he was able to maintain a huge amount of his own identity. I'd argue he was the best made of the three original killers for that exact reason. The Trapper's story was so inconsistent, and his identity so generic, that he was always very difficult to distinguish from his inspiration Jason, and the identity of the Wraith was so different from his story that it was hard to reconcile the two until his tome came in to weld the gap shut. However, the identity of the hillbilly suited his character perfectly, in a way that made him distinct from his inspirations, because of one central theme that tied the whole thing together. Isolation. And the fight or flight territorial scrappiness that comes from that isolation. But before we look into how well the theme is presented and tied into his character, I want to first talk about the importance of the theme itself, and why picking it was the first step in defining the hillbilly's identity. I have already talked about how the hills have eyes of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre were Billy's primary sources of inspiration, but there's one very relevant idea that ties both of those movies together that the hillbilly entirely rejects. The strength of family bonds. The cannibal clan in The Hills Have Eyes are threatening because they work closely as a family. They use numbers, strategy and the home field advantage to ambush travellers in the desert. And one of the core messages of the movie is told through the conflict between the cannibal family and the supposedly civilised all-American family who devolve into savagery by the end of the movie. And the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is even less subtle about this idea. The Sawyer family are as threatening as they are because each member serves a specific role in the family unit. Nubbins lures in passers-by, Bubba kills them, Drayton cooks them, and Bubba serves them to the wheelchair-bound and corpse-like Grandpa Sawyer. None of the family could function without the involvement of the other members. Without the muscle of Bubba to kill people they would go on to eat, Drayton would just be an eccentric garage owner with a lot of expensive barbecue equipment. Without Drayton calling the shots and banging their heads together, Nubbins would just be a peculiar young man with a birthmark and a photography hobby. And without his family to keep him safe, secure and with purpose, Bubba would be morose and incapable of functioning on his own due to his cognitive and communication difficulties. This was actually explored as one of the few genuinely good things about Texas Chainsaw 3D. It depicted Bubba without his family for the first time, and he was barely functional reduced to biding his time in the abandoned family home until he found someone new to attach to. The hillbilly flips a script on this, and decides to instead show us a character defined by his independence from and enmity towards his family. 
when Max and Evelyn Thompson brought their baby boy into the world, they hated him as soon as they saw him. His skin was gnarled like tree bark, he walked with a limp, and his tome implies that he has breathing problems that cause occasional migraines, as well as serious communication problems. You would think that responsible parents would care for their boy regardless, but the Thompsons had other plans for their unwanted son. They bricked up the little boy with no name in a sealed, dark room for his entire youth, feeding him to a slot in the door and depriving him of all contact with the outside world. They didn't even keep him in the house, because you can see on the fractured cowshed map that the room they kept him in is built onto the side of the cowshed itself, not the main farmhouse. The Thompson son was kept with the sick livestock, sealed away in a dark room for most of his life, until one day, he escaped. He broke out of his brickwork jail and rampaged across the farm. Much like most of Behaviour's old continuity, what happened afterwards was a little unclear, because different sources tell us different things. In the Hillbillies base law, it says the bodies of Max and Evelyn were never found. But the map description of Coldwind Farm says that the bodies of one Mr. and Mrs. Adams were found in the basement of the farmhouse. Since the Adamses were apparently the ones who built the farm before its sudden shutdown in 1946, it seems like the Adams family, no not that one, was the development name for the Thompsons before it eventually got changed. Honestly, I completely discount the Coldwind Farm law as canon because it's a fucking mess. The Adamses were clearly never meant to stay in the game after the name changed to the Thompsons, and the date of 1946 is also a bit too early. The commercial one-man lightweight chainsaw wasn't really on the market until about 1959, when the Husqvarna 90 first sold in Europe. So how would Coldwind Farm have one in 1946? Regardless, once Max broke out of his box, he dispatched his abusive parents and the farm basically went dark from there. And that's how Billy's base story ends. No emotional reconciliation, no mention of the entity snatching him up, nothing pretty much just, he killed them. When compared to the newer stories that we tend to get, it feels more like a factual reporting of events, like a newspaper or an online blog, than necessarily a story. And that isn't inherently a bad thing. Every story back then was like this, so it's not like it was a problem that Billy specifically had, but it did result in a very interesting character that kinda got shafted by Behaviour's primitive approach to storytelling at the time. I will say this though, unlike most of the other stories at the time, you actually felt a bit of emotion about the hillbilly, but that comes more from the story as a whole picking a good emotional core of childhood neglect and abuse to base the story around, and less because it was actually written well. Hillbilly's tome had a simple task, modernise his story by illustrating not just what happened to him, but also the effects that those things had on him by fleshing out his personality. And long story short, a man named Boy did this fantastically. And it did this by further differentiating him from his inspiration in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, through a sophisticated and high logical internal monologue from Billy's perspective. The reason this worked so well is because until now, Billy's level of intelligence, articulation and sanity has never really been explored because his personality has never really been allowed to directly shine through. Everything we've gleaned about him comes from other people's observations of him, whether that's Benedict Baker or the omniscient narrative voice of his original base law. Which is actually fine for a character whose agency and actions define their story, like, say, the Oni. We can tell who the Oni is by his actions, exactly as he appears. But one of the core reasons behind Billy's tragic upbringing is that he is not the monster that his parents thought he was, and was denied the ability to choose his own path as a result. His entire story hinges on the fact that he's misunderstood by everyone in his life, and is largely incapable of doing much about it. So an internal monologue was a necessary means for us to understand him, because the only accurate perception of him is his own. This plays into the theme of isolation. Max's perspective on himself and everyone around him 
is so different from the rest of the world that alienates him from them. They see him as a monster when he knows he's a victim, and he's the only person that knows it. So as well as being physically isolated by his restraints, he's emotionally isolated from the rest of the world. His family and the corrupt cop they associate with see him as a blunt instrument, less even than an animal. Something not to be loved or cared for or even given a name, but something to be unleashed for entertainment and contained out of public view. And by showing us Billy's perspective on the world, and the few people that he's ever interacted with, it illustrates things about those people too. For starters, Max Thompson Sr. is even more of a heartless monster than he is in the Hillbillies Bay story. If for some obscure reason you wanted to read his character charitably before, you probably could. After all, he didn't kill his infant son, so he might have still loved his boy, but didn't know how to care for him properly. Or maybe the people around him were even worse than he was, and was going to ruin all their lives if his son's deformities were discovered. Again, this was never strictly implied, but if you really wanted to view him in a more charitable light, there was nothing stopping you from doing so. But in this story, the Elder Thompson's vileness is put on full display. He launders money for the police, and seems to have no hardship of his own to contest with. His life is fine, he has no reason to treat his son as brutally as he does. But by referring to his son as a killing tool, and joking about his deformities to the cops, Max Thompson Sr. firmly ensconces himself in the position of the biggest asshole on earth. Well done James Corden, you're off the hook. Don't get too comfortable, you're still a prat when you're not on Gavin and Stacey. As the story goes on, we get glimpses of the vicious abuse that Max and Evelyn Thompson inflicted on their little boy. They poured a pot full of boiling water on him and bound and gagged him at night to try and quiet him down. His mother poured hot sauce down his throat for even trying to speak. His father beat him with his belt and smashed his head, screamed at him right in his ear when he was just a baby. Child abuse is a horrible topic in any piece of media, especially one that goes into as much detail as this one. And the Thompson parents are never portrayed as anything other than the truly vile human beings they are, utterly devoid of compassion and love for their son. All that being said, it might surprise you to hear that the Thompson parents are not even a particularly big part of this particular story. The horrific abusers, who logically should be the main villains of their son's story, become a footnote in it. His father is dead by the end of the second memory, and his mother meets her violent end in the third. The main conflict of the story puts Max in between the two new elements that a man named Boy introduced to his story, the television and the police chief. I talked about the TV before, when I did my review of all the stories in Tome 5, including this one, so I don't want to dwell on it too long. But the TV is a core part of this story because it gives the hillbilly some perspective on the outside world. Not a lot, and it's quite badly distorted, but it gives him something to compare his life to and forms the driving force behind his campaign of vengeance. If all he ever knew was pain with no respite whatsoever, then there'd be no hope of anything better, and he'd likely stay as a prisoner of his family forever. But the TV represents an idealised world where good things happen to good people, where parents care for their children and help them grow into heroes. And it works so well because it contrasts with the harsh reality of Max's world personified by the police chief. Because you've got to remember, this is mid 20th century, right? If young Max ever saw the police or really any authority figure on TV, it was likely in a positive light, something that the story actually draws attention to. Max knows from the television that the police and his parents are meant to protect him, not laugh at him and hurt him. And a lot of his rage comes from the knowledge that the world of the TV is a lie. That's why the police chief is the main villain of Max's story. He is the symbol of the world that hates him. Just because Max has killed his parents doesn't mean the world will accept him, because everybody else around him still sees him as a monster. 
the police chief doesn't see Max killing his parents and the AMA deputies as the actions of an abused young man regaining his freedom. All he sees is a rabid animal on a rampage because he does not understand, or doesn't care, that Max is human too, with his own articulate thoughts and feelings that are just as valid as his. This is only exacerbated by Max's communication difficulties. He regularly speaks throughout the story, but nothing he says ever seems to be understood by whoever he's speaking to. For example, when he confronts his mother in the third memory, he shakes her like a rag doll, desperate to know his name. She doesn't even try to respond because she can't understand him, she doesn't know what he wants. He understands everybody else just fine, all his father's abuse and the police's sneering really sinks in. But his vocalisations are incomprehensible to anybody else. Even in speech, he's alienated from the rest of the world, and that makes it much harder for anybody else to understand his perspective. It must be a lot easier to pretend that the abused young man in front of you isn't a human worth caring about if he can't vocalise how it makes him feel in a way that you can understand. I'm not saying the Thompsons or the police would have necessarily cared for Max even if he had been able to comprehensibly speak, but they'd have at least had to engage with him on an intellectual level and understand that he had thoughts and feelings, even if they ended up not caring about them anyway. Instead, the chief's ignorance of Max's intelligence becomes his greatest downfall. He sends deputies in to deal with him, but Max ambushes and kills them one by one with the same startling brutality they enjoyed watching so much when he kills cattle for their entertainment. They never tried to engage with him or understand him as a human, preferring to alienate him and leave him at the mercy of his parents. So when the time came for Max to reply in kind, he had no reason to give their lives a second thought. And while the chief is trying to trick Max into surrendering so he can kill him, Max is already several steps ahead. He's taunting the chief, egging him to bring on everything he's got because Max is ready for him, and the chief's ignorance causes him to play right into Max's hands. This is when we see the effects of Max's upbringing that shaped him into a killer. He has absolutely no reservations about the horrific violence that he subjects his tormentors to. His entire life up until this point has been governed by brutality. Whether that's the violence that his parents inflicted onto him, or the violence they forced him to inflict in turn against the cattle. Violence has shaped his identity, for better or worse. So when the time comes to bring that violence to bear against those who shaped that identity, he takes to it like a duck to water. When he beats in the head of the first deputy and watches him stagger around like a zombie, there's no guilt there, no concept of the man's life having any value or any family that would miss him. And Max isn't to blame for that at all. He's only a killer because that's what they made him. And so the only people responsible for their brutal deaths is themselves. Max is so detached from them that their deaths have no moral weight on his mind. So he resorts to playing with their brains in his hands reminiscing about TV shows as if he'd had a relaxing walk by a lake, not beaten several men to death with a hammer, a tree branch and his bare hands. But what interested me here is how Max seems subtly aware of how unaffected he is by all the harm he causes. This is where the TV comes back in, because while his family and the cops were pushing him towards a life of violence and brutality, the TV was the closest he ever had to a moral compass. I love the illusion to Superman, another unusual and powerful little boy taken in by rural parents who didn't necessarily want him at first. But despite literally being an alien, Clark Kent was not alienated or abused by his family on Earth. Jonathan and Martha Kent treated their boy with love and respect, even if he wasn't quite what they expected him to be and taught him right from wrong while ensuring he grew up healthy, happy, and free to be whoever he wanted to be. That life was all Max Thompson Jr. ever wanted. He's angry at the world and everybody he's ever met along the way because they all lied to him. They showed him a world of heroism and idealism and never let him in. So we shouldn't be surprised that the first thing he wants when he's free is to hide again. 
Once he dispatches the police chief and feeds the pigs to the pigs. And no, I did not let a symbolism slip past me. Max is free to choose his own path in the world. But the events leading up to this point have shown him that maybe the world isn't ready to welcome him. Clark was a hero who saved the day and was loved by everyone. But poor Max isn't a hero at all. Everyone else from that world has tried to hurt him. So why should he expect anything different from the rest of the world? Everyone outside that little room has lied to him, abused him, isolated him, and stripped him of his agency as a human. And you can't blame him for just wanting to nestle down on the farm and live a quiet life where nothing can hurt him again. His parents and their associates turned him into a monster that the world will always fear and hate. So Max is content to retreat back to his TV and withdraw from this world into a fabrication of a better one. But what do I know about empathy and understanding other people? I'm a twins main. I'm not exactly known for my ability to care about my fellow man. So, I decided to draft in a long-time Billy Noah, and arguably the most empathetic man in the world, to give his take on the Hillbillies lore. Ladies and gentlemen, the Space Billy master himself, Sofa Rex. Hello fellow DVD enjoyers. My name is Sofrix. Most of you don't know me, but I am a hillbilly main. I play a lot of hillbilly, garnered quite some hours on him, made tutorials on him, make a lot of videos on him, as you can see in the background. Um, today I was invited by the man, the myth, the legend, Pixel Bush himself, to make a small um, part of what I think of the hillbilly lore, because I've made him. Um, if I have to be honest, the story is quite heartbreaking. Um, I never really read any lores, except for this one. This is one of the first lores that I actually read through. And the fact that Billy was being shunned as a kid, was being locked up in a basement by his own parents because he was deformed, is such a sad story. The whole story about him being a youngster, being fed through a hole in the wall, watching television all day because his parents don't want him outside. Um, a cool detail about that is the brick stone add-on. It actually is the stone where he broke free with. Um, at one point in the lore they talk about how he doesn't know his own name and he's desperate to know his own name. Um, he kills his own dad because he was basically literally a machine of slaughter and, and joy for their parents. As in uh, laughing with him. Um, at one point he kills his dad in a haze of anger and confusion needed to kill sheep, but he killed his dad rather than killing the sheep. And afterwards he names himself Max Thompson Jr. because he literally still did not have a name. They never named him. But I think those are all cool details and, and it all comes together why he's a junior um, compared to the senior. All those things. It's such a saddening story. If you read it through, it actually makes you sad. It made me feel sad. Um, the neglectance of love the, the actual neglectors of a base feeling towards another human being because of his, his yeah, deformation, the fact that he was deformed, it's just insane. I can never fathom how people can be so ignorant and so ah, disgusting people towards somebody that is deformed. So, yeah, being a hillbilly man and reading this lore was actually heartbreaking. So, I'm looking forward to what Pixel Bush has to say for himself. Um, but yeah, that was my thought on Hillbilly. I hope more people will be playing him soon. So, thank you for having me, Pixel Bush. And up to you, buddy. Thank you, Sofa Man. For those who aren't aware, Sofa has just gone back to streaming regularly as a Hillbilly player, so do go check him out at your earliest convenience. His links are in the description. For the weight of its subject matter and the graphic nature of its violence, A Man Named Boy is a hard story to read. But it's one of the few Dead by Daylight stories I could safely recommend to someone who has never heard of the game before. It's good enough to stand on its own as a macabre tale of a young man reclaiming his life from his abusers and reconciling the ideal world he's always been shown with his horrific reality as a victim of serious brutality. 
It is a perfect representation of who the hillbilly is. He's someone who, despite spending his entire life reduced to less than even an animal by everyone he'd ever met, proved himself to be the one with all the power and all the humanity in the end. That is the identity that Behaviour perfectly captured for one of its oldest and greatest killers. And it's one that sets him apart from the older horror icons that inspired him and the killers that would go on to follow him in Dead by Daylight. The story is sophisticated, intelligent, and makes the best use out of the very limited tools that Billy's original lore provided us with. In fact, the hardest part I found talking about a man named Boy was something really quite small. Every time I've had to call him Max, it never felt right because at the end of the day, it's the name of his abuser, his father. The end of his story has him acknowledge that maybe that shouldn't be his name, and he resolves to search the farmhouse and his father's personal effects to find his true name, but I don't think we should ever learn it, because to us, he'll always just be Billy. That's who he is, and we wouldn't have it any other way. Okay, I do hope you got a lot out of that long awaited deep dive into the hillbilly. If you enjoyed what I make, then you know the drill, please do subscribe and more lore content will be coming very, very soon. But in addition to lore videos, I have a separate general DVD discussion video in the works and I want to talk about some horror movies, so do be ready for those when they do come. If you wish to hear more about Strafer Rex's insights on anything to do with Billy, go check out his Twitter or his Twitch stream, both of them are linked in the description. Down in the description you can also find links to my Twitch, my Twitter, my Discord server, my Patreon and Ko-fi if you feel like this content deserves your money, and links to my merch store where you can pick up this very fetching Victor t-shirt if you feel the need for it. It's very comfy though, I I'll tell you that. Once again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Ta-ta for now.